All great things must first wear terrifying and monstrous masks in order to inscribe themselves onto the hearts of mankind. They must first be drenched in blood for a long, long time. Nietzsche said that mankind will have to learn a harsh lesson before he can truly progress. And that lesson is that we have to be wary of the resentful. The deepest and cruelest hate in all of history has not come from the strong and their fury, but has always come from the vengeance of the weak. This is the dark, unspoken demon that lives beneath modern liberated society. Gifting everybody rights does not solve the psychological problem within man, that losers resent winners. And when this resentment is ignited, the resentful gather together and charge around as mobs, pulling down everything they see as higher and more successful than them. But we struggle to grasp how dangerous this emotion really is. Because when resentment infects a person, it becomes crafty and it makes them crafty. They lie to themselves about what is wrong with them. They hide it under a beautiful mask because it is far too ugly to look at directly. So a resentful man tells himself and tells other people that he is pursuing something beautiful instead of something malicious. He tells those around him that he is a champion for equality, that he feels passionate about fairness, that he is bringing the world towards justice. The communist revolution sold itself to the people as such a beautiful lie. But of course in practice, it weaponized this low emotion inside man, vengeance. It stirred up a frenzy inside the souls of the failed members of society, and it united them in their hate. It then crafted this mob into a revolutionary army, which it used to tear down the majestic old structures and rob, rape and murder the productive class. This cleared the way for a new power, a power built on lies. Then. Once it had secured its catch, it revealed its true hateful face. Now, with their power secure, these Bolsheviks set out on a project to carve their conquest into the shape that they wanted it to be, like a butcher hacking away at a living animal. They murdered millions at an industrial scale. They began shipping populations all across the country, sending them to the Siberian gulags. They began brainwashing everybody using the school system. They created the NKVD to inspire toxic paranoia. It was as if the spirit of a serial killer created a government. First, they charm you. They're affable and charismatic. They say all the right things. They make you trust them. Then they lure you into isolation. Suddenly their face changes. Their smile vanishes and something twisted appears. Their eyes go glassy and empty, and they beat you and then proceed to peel off your skin while you're still alive. The French Revolution was also like this, the promise of liberation drenched in gallons of blood. It set the tone for this modern approach to power. Lie, lie to the stupid masses exploit their unconsciousness of their vengeance, stir up their envy and discontent, promise them the most beautiful lies, and then use their malice to destroy your enemy. This is the predicate for modern culture. It is a victim psychosis. All these corporations and institutions going woke, simping for any claim of oppression. They do this because it is the most effective path to power. And unless man learns, unless he transforms and overcomes this resentment, he will be forever exploited this way. Every achievement of freedom, liberty, equality and justice that inspires his heart will be co-opted by these savvy, cruel and devious revolutionaries. But tragically, man always has to learn these things the hard way. The Russians now have a good sense to not listen to someone bullshitting you with beautiful ideas. Because their grandfather was worked to death in a camp. Pain taught them the meaning of resentments. And it has scarred them for eternity. And the West is currently at the beginning of its education. 
there is a swelling storm of resentment being stirred up in many parts of the population. Malicious opportunists could try to use this to their own advantage. Western man might be about to have his communist revolution. But there is a white pill. If Western man wishes not to learn the hard way, he simply needs to become aware of this vengeance. He needs to raise himself to a higher level of consciousness and understand the nature of this hate. As Nietzsche said, for man to be redeemed from vengeance is for me the bridge to the highest hope and a rainbow after long, long storms. For man to be redeemed from vengeance is for me the bridge to the highest hope and a rainbow after long, long storms. What a zinger. What a beautiful quote. What a aphorism. Imagine if we could conduct an occult ritual and bring Nietzsche back to life so we could stick him up on Twitter and TikTok. He'd be running around Turin. He could be running around northern Italy with his little phone, his little iPhone, and he could be dropping these bangers in the iPhone. He could go up onto Twitter and he could... (laughs) Sam Harris would be there smashing in his cope, his stupid low IQ his midwit thoughts into into his Twitter he could be posting up his midwit tweets and then Nietzsche with his typical laconic style would go in with one liners with one word one liners and be right writing underneath every single Sam Harris tweet saying dork soy cope <laughs> These midway intellectuals. This is like this is like literally like a Nietzsche gossip channel. This is this is like a tabloid tabloid tier quality of Nietzsche gossip channel. And um, because I'm going to start talking to you about another cope midway public intellectual. This is Stephen Pinkner. Stephen Pinkner fantasized a while ago. I, he had some you know one of his terrible shitty books. He fantasized about going back in time and confronting Nietzsche. All right, he, he fantasized about going back in time and confronting Nietzsche and saying to Nietzsche, "I am cold." hard and without conscience you're short so he fantasizes about going back in time and calling Nietzsche short and then saying that he's going to take advantage of Nietzsche's sister he's going to go over and he's going to rape Nietzsche's sister this is his this is his power fantasy his his feelings he sits there in his mediocrity in his midwittery he sits there and he says to himself I'm moral I'm a good guy I'm a public intellectual in the modern age and he's sitting there this is what like I'm going to talk to you about resentment this is what resentment is he sits there and he he's in his thoughts and he's fantasizing about going back in time and calling a dead German incel who lived on the mountain short and in raping his sister. Like, what is wrong with these people? These people are so strange. And people hold Stephen Pinkner up as some type of, you know, celebrated god of some sort. And this is the type of stuff, this is the type of consciousness inside these guys. They're so full of twisted hate that they fantasize about these delusions. And guess what? Guess what? Stephen Pinkner, go up and, and type into the into Google, Stephen Pinkner, Jeffrey Epstein, and, and guess what you'll see? A picture of them two hanging out. Picture these two these two buddies hanging out. These two genius midwit public intellectuals hanging out. I bet you're flying. They're probably flying all over the world. I bet you they, they were. I bet you're hanging around an awful lot more places than just at some fancy dinner and all this type of stuff. So this is this is the type of people I'm fighting against. This is my this is my crusade. And this is my war. I'm trying to save you from the midwits. Save you from the resentful, spiteful, low IQ midwits. This is what the problem is. So today, now that we've got the the Nietzsche gossip tabloid section over and done with, I'm going to talk to you about resentment. I'm going to talk to you about the true demon that lives in our modern world and lives inside you. Now, what Nietzsche does not get enough credit for is how competent he was uh, of a psychologist. Because he was a psychologist in the old style. He was an actual effective psychologist, someone who was good at doing psychology, which was being able to look inside man's soul or look inside man's emotional world and understand man's motivations and man's intentions. Your model for psychology is obviously influenced by the culture that you grow up in. So your idea of a psychologist is the, the sort of the cope dealer, the person who sits there in their little chair and babysits your brain and gives you elaborate rationalizations to to, to explain away the fact that you're a failure and you lack thumos and you lack will to power. The person who um, talks to you about all these elaborate conceptions and all this type of stuff so that they can brainwash you to be a pleb, to be a pawn for the new world order. But that is not what Nietzsche was. Nietzsche was in the grand old style, style, someone who sat down and tried to look into why man felt the way man feels. Why we feel emotions and why we are motivated to act on these emotions and what are these these emotions authentically trying to tell us because our emotions are, are fundamentally barbaric we like to effeminize we like to um 
sort of glitter and colour our emotions. We like to think that all our emotions are soft and gentle and beautiful. And we like to think that we've got all these beautiful emotions inside of us that are our true motivation. These are all these type of things that we say to ourselves. We're empathetic or we're driven towards these beautiful ideas and all this. But instead, inside of us, there's some horrific things, some brutal things. Some things as crude as something like laziness or simply not caring. Even though we say we do, we, we really don't. We turn, we turn the other cheek all the time, not because we are strong, but because we just simply do not care. And also our envy, our resentment, our nastiness. This, these emotions exist inside of us and they motivate us deeply. And one of the ugliest and most prominent and most revealing emotions of all is resentment. And it is one of the most important emotions for you to overcome in order for you to evolve into someone um, who is in any way useful in the world, in any way competent, in any way powerful. And if you allow resentment to sit inside your soul, it becomes something toxic. It festers inside of you and it destroys you. Now, to give you an example of this, I'm going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about how resentment ruined my life at one point. So when I was younger, I grew up, I lived this um, pretty normal life, you know, by, by all accounts. You know, I have Steph's story, I guess, is unique to Steph. But I grew up with a two-family, ho- two-parent household. And I went to school and all these type of things. I had no divorces and none of this stuff. But there was one constant tension point in my life. I was always moving school. So I grew up in another country and I went to Ireland. And I came to Ireland when I was five. And so I started school um, when I was five. And I kind of felt uh, like, uh, like an outsider because I had a strong accent you know and I was this outsider who came in when I was five and at that very outset I had this little bit of a rough time getting started in school I was like who are these people I don't know any of these people I've got this accent of all these type of things and I remember I used to complain to my mum and my dad a lot I was like why is this happening what's going on why have you suddenly taken me out of the bliss of not having to go to work and now you've put me in this brainwash camp where I have to sit down and talk to all these freakish Irish people with me with me with this weird accent and all this type of stuff and Eventually, I got over that. I sort of settled in. That was all well and good. I started making friends. It wasn't. It wasn't that big of a deal, you know. It was. It was pretty okay. And my accent started to go away, and I started to sound an awful lot more like a local. And Dad, actually, I remember coming home one day, and I said something like uh, "water." So you know, instead of saying "water," "water" properly, "water," I I come in and I go "water," which is like the Irish accent. Give us a glass of water, there, would you? And Dad, uh, I remember this distinctly. I was so young as well. I was like, you know, five or six or something like that. But Dad just like paused and he looked over at me and he's like, well, "What did you say?" <laughs> and then. I was like the laughing stock of the family for a good couple of weeks. And uh, I settled in and I started to adapt and I morphed and I became w- one of the people. I made all these friends and it was a big triumph for me. I started off going into this school thing. I was like, why are you putting me into this Prussian military education system? And why are you bring- Are you trying to set me up on the path to get into student debt so I become enslaved to the usury of the new world order? Like, what's going on here? Like, who's who's what, what's happening here? But, you know, eventually I settled in and I calmed down. My spirit might have been correct in my anxieties, but I calmed down. And then what happened is um, around about, I, I, you know, maybe I was 10 or something like this. It was time, my, my mom and my dad got a mortgage and they got their own house because they were living in, like they were renting a house and they were just right beside their parents. They'd just moved back from this other country so getting themselves all set up. And they got a mortgage to, for another house. Now, of course, I didn't understand this. All I understood is that mom walks in one day or dad walks in, I can't remember who it was, and says, we're moving. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, I don't know what that means, but anyway, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Am I going to be far away from... It's like, yeah, we're going to be further away. Now, eventually I started to realize that moving meant that I was going to move school. And that was a big deal. That was something that I was... No, I could not tolerate that because I had made all these friends. And now I was going to get moved out to this other school. And this was going to sever me from all this and I'm going to have to start again. And then I was moved to this new school. And then I go into this new school. And it's something's different because... I go from having all these defined characters, all these friends. We had sort of started school around about the same time, so I'd been integrated with them. I'd lived in this place with all these people. I had all these social connections sorted out. And then when I moved to this new school, I was arriving late. You know, I was arriving three, two, three years into the experience. And so I was I was a complete newbie now. And it was weird because now I had a normal accent from around the area, but I was still now more of an outsider because all of these people had become social defined. All of these people in this class, they had all known each other for three years, so they all knew each other. There was like the, the cool group and the girls and all this type of stuff and the, the lads and the lads had their ways of doing things and, you know, they, they did things slightly different than the other school and they had all their jokes and they all knew each other from around. They'd been to each other's houses and stuff like this and I just sort of pop up like, you know, how you doing guys? And I remember mum got me this big yellow coat. Oh mum, like what were you doing? So she got me this big yellow coat so I looked like a fucking dork. I looked like an absolute tool, you know, with this massive yellow coat, literally like 
like a trench coat down probably to my knees or something like that probably with some dorky sandwich inside of it it's like man you know this is the type of stuff you'd make a movie for like a kid who's gonna get bullied and so I go in to this new school and of course people are sort of testing you out they're like who's this kid they're like who's this fucking new dude and they're they're kind of jabbing at me and all this and I was always like an artistic creative guy and I was quite good with people but I was very nervous going into this and I was very angry because I was mad at my parents for moving me out of this situation I was mad at me I'm mad at them for taking me from my defined place that I had won that I'd made all these friends and moving me into this new thing and I had all these issues and I started to complain about bullying and then my grandfather basically sat me down one day and said just you know if anybody tries to bully you just like punch them in the face and so <laughs> I just <laughs> go into school one day and some guy just like says something to me I'd actually think he said something about like uh, the coat or maybe my accent or something like that and I bet the living fuck out of him now it wasn't like I was some giga chat and all this but I just it was like autistically aggressive I guess you could say I just ran up and then just helicopter punched gave him an absolute hiding of a lifetime first ever fight you know and absolutely messed him up creamed them and uh, you know then uh, everybody all of a sudden everything changed and everybody was sort of like wow that dude like you know all the lads were sort of like yeah go on fights they love fights they tried to set me up and make me fight again and all this it just became like bloodlust you could see the sort of Roman instincts when they were like gladiator fights they could smell the blood they were like go fight someone else we want to see death we want to see war I was almost like I should have been like Maximus and said are you not entertained are you not entertained but um, alas that did not happen but that allowed me to sort of socially define myself say stop fucking fucking around with me then eventually you know over the years I settled in it was all that good that was all good but I had this sort of nagging annoyance in the back of my head and it wasn't too bad but I sort of blamed my parents and I would always say it to them you know and it's it's one of these childish things because I'd say to them well, you fucked up by moving me out of school and I would be like I'll be mad at them I'd be a bit salty about it you know I'm always saying you you moved me out of school and you made it difficult for me to 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 adapt to this new situation and I'm always kind of jibing at them and always saying it to them I know I was young so I didn't really understand what was going on but I think about it now I feel really I feel really guilty about it I feel really bad about it because you know your mom and your dad getting a mortgage trying to set up a house they're trying your best and then you know imagine you make this big decision and you try to get this your own house for your kid and you try to bring, put them into school and it's fucking hard doing man it's hard to live your life you're there going to work you're there just trying to figure things out you're not like you don't have everything sorted out and I'm the kid expecting them to be gods to make all the right decisions and it's not like they screwed everything up and all this it's just it was awkward for me dealing with everything and they didn't you know and I'm there and I'm just jibing at them I'm saying you fucked my life up you screwed this up I'm unhappy and maybe I wasn't even as unhappy as I needed to be I was just being more spiteful towards them because I was a little bit mad about them and I was getting on perfectly fine and I was like doing quite well eventually And but I was still sort of you know jibing at them being like that was a bad decision you shouldn't have moved me out of school you made my life harder you screwed things up for me and all this type of stuff and then what happens is towards the end of school so this is primary school for you Americans who you know do school the wrong way we, we Irish do it the right way we have primary school and then we have secondary school not like oh, junior high the high school low school what are you stoners like high school I'm in high school shut up like Jesus Christ so we go from primary school to secondary school this is basically around about the time when you hit puberty which is also quite interesting that it's structured this way so as we're transitioning into secondary school around about 12 13 I am um, I again was in the same situation where I had made all these socially defined friends I'd won these new friends I knew all these people and then mom and dad come in and they sent me down to say right you're going to go off to boarding school and I'm like what and then all these other people are going to the local secondary school you know and they're all going to hang out and I'd met all these I knew, knew all these people I was hanging out with them I was getting to know them even actually maybe in the last two years that I was there I started to become sort of like popular I started to get, become friendly with them I got my first kiss and stuff like this I'd met them and then mum and dad turn around and they're like alright we're, we're going we're gonna to do it again we're going to move you again and I'm like listen you fucking motherfuckers what do you t- how are you you're ruining my life what is going on how dare you what is going on but like d- to be more serious I remember it was like deep knotted anger I remember I was really really salty about this I did not take this well at all this was not easy for me and they are of course trying to make the best choice for my education trying to put me to the best school that they could find around and um and yeah they like you know they sent me off to this and that's basically what happened and I remember I was just kicking up stink I was like I'm not doing it I don't want to go I want to go with my friends I want to go where I know I want to go when I know and then you know boarding schools you go and you stay there and you go and live in the dorms and all this type of stuff and so the first day of boarding school they drove me down they said look try it and then if you don't like it you can leave <laughs> and so we went down and um, I went with with my parents and I um, 
I uh, go and they drop me off and all this type of stuff. And in the car in there, I'm basically like crying, saying, I don't want to be here. I don't like this. I hate this, all this type of stuff. This is stupid. I'm, I'm just going to stay and then I'm going to leave. And I remember saying, so can I, if I don't like it, can I, will you come back and get me tomorrow? You know, or something like that. Or would you come back and get me? I'll, I'll send you a text and you can come back and get me tomorrow or the day after or something like this. And they're like, yes, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll do that. We'll come back, get you tomorrow. Yeah. Because, you know, they're just placating the stupid childlike behavior. They're like, you'll fucking get over it. You'll adapt, like grow up, whatever. And so they dropped me there. And then, of course, I like text them on my little boomer phone. I don't know if you remember those like Nokia's and all this. And I was like, I don't like this. Would you come pick me up? I, I think I sent that two days later. And they, re they you know, I don't think they replied or they replied no or something like this. They said, we can't do that. Stay there till the end of the week. And I was devastated. And I was absolutely devastated. And I was so mad because of this, because I felt betrayed now. And I felt like they had just screwed my life up again. And now they were just actively trying to sabotage my life. And again, it became this big point of complaint. And this big thing that sat in my mind, I remember, like, I remember my psychology when I was working this out, I could see this knot sitting in my mind where I'm, I'm blaming them. I'm sort of like, if, if, you know, if something goes wrong, it's like that meme of the guy on the bike and he puts like the, the, the stick through the spokes and then he falls over and he's lying on the floor and he's like ah oh, oh, the government or like you know my, my and it was like that was me but I was being like oh my parents and my parents it's everything is their fault and I developed this like deep knotted saltiness towards them I get really really aggressively angry really really spiteful I would blame them about everything I wouldn't speak to them you know like I remember the first couple of weeks the first couple of months or maybe even years I can't even remember how long this went on but I would just come home on the weekends so I was going to this boarding school I'd come home on the weekends I'd go straight up to my room wouldn't even talk to them you know I wouldn't come down come down for food and then go straight up to the room but, you know a spiteful little petulant stroppy child but really deep down there was that deep deep feeling of betrayal and anger and of course the confusion because I was a kid and all this stuff was changing around me and my emotions were getting anxious because I was going into these new environments and I was needing to stand up and learn how to socialize and learn how to meet people and learn how to go through challenge and adversity and that's scary and that's intimidating so all these emotions stir up inside of me and it forces me to become better and it's very confusing and so I'm trying to find an outlet to blame I'm trying to say well it's not my fault it's someone else's fault I'm trying to escape you know and this is this is sort of the inner coward in some sense it's very normal and natural, but I'm getting flung into this new environment and I want an escape. And I want to say, I don't have to take responsibility for this situation. I don't have to be the one to stand up and say, I'm going to make the most. All right, everything's changed. I'm going to make, the, I'm going to make new friends. I'm going to make the most of this. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to do well. I'm going to figure out what's going on. And that's all scary to do that because that's risky and you have, to, you have to go. You have to go after it. You have to go and launch yourself upon the world. And I'd done that before. And it's so weird, but I had done that before and proven to myself that I can do that. But still, I did not know that. I did not know myself. I was young. I was naive and so instead of me being able to embrace that mindset and have that mature perspective instead I I turned and I thought about my parents and I said I'll blame them fuck them it's them they're they're my escape I can escape into blaming them and that that blame was never ending I, I remember realizing this years later that there's nothing they could have said or done that would have made that better like it was almost like I was trying to force mum or dad to admit that it's like you, you I fucked your life up it's my fault it's almost, almost like I wanted them to stand up and be like it's my fault I am guilty I am the one who ruined your life yes we screwed it up but like that, what's that gonna change is the, is the clock just gonna pause like a film and go and take us back to when I was like four years old again and, and let us start again where everything goes perfect like it's just not possible but something in me wanted that sort of submission out of them it wanted them to break it wanted do you know what I wanted them to feel I wanted them to feel the pain that I was feeling. I wanted them to feel the confusion, the anxiety, the pain, the struggle. I wanted them to feel that so that they would, that it was, it, it's so interesting. It's like I can feel the feelings coming up in my body now. I wanted them to feel the hurt so that they would, they would sort of I, I maybe become aware or become conscious. It was this strange psychology and really think about this because that's me projecting my pain into them as an act of vengeance. I was young, of course, as my parents, I'd never do something ugly with that. But look, look at that. Log look at the logic of that, the logic of the soul there. I have all this confusion. I have all these knots and I blame them for this. And I and I project that blame upon them. And it's not rational and it's not true. And it's about me denying my hero's journey, denying my ability to say it's my responsibility to take advantage of this. It's my responsibility to take advantage of these problems in this world around me. Instead, I project it on them. And when I project it on them, it's it's aggressive. I want 
want them to get damaged. I want them to get hurt. I want them to humble themselves. I want them to prostrate themselves. I want them to buckle and get down on one knee and say, I am guilty. I am ashamed. I want them to cry. I want them to feel pain. I want them to feel anxiety. I want them to feel negativity that I'm feeling. I'm like spreading a disease onto them. And it's aggressive. It's horrible. And I remember this possessed me for years. It was a knotted, dark resentment. And when I went to this new school, this was probably one of the best periods of my life because what happened is I got put into a dorm with people. I came in from the very, very start. Everybody was coming in from all across the world. So we were all on the same level playing field. And it was not like any of those previous school experiences. And I started out and I ended up in the popular crew and I ended up doing really well, getting to know everybody. I was like doing great with the girls. I was doing great with everything. It was all fantastic. I was like literally thrived there. It was one of, one of the best periods of my life. It was just easy. Everything was on the up. Everything worked. I hung out with everybody, got big into sports then, all these type of things. I was doing fantastic, but you wouldn't even realize if you were my mom and my dad. And I feel so fucking bad about this because I would go home then and it was like, how's school? And they'd be like, yeah, it's like, you know, whatever. Yeah, sh sh shut up. <laughs> you know, I was just closed off. I closed off to them and said no, because I was angry at them. And it's so crushing. Like, it just destroys a relationship. It's brutal. They don't, they didn't even know who their son was. You know, they didn't, they didn't get to see that for many years in their, in the teenage years, because I was, I was bitter and I was, you know, a stroppy teenager, like that typical era. Like, this is what was manifesting. And it was that knotted, angry resentment that was, that was motivating this. And then eventually I went to college and this, like, I, I, I don't know, as I became 16, 17, 18, I got an awful lot better. I basically got over this stuff, matured, and um, began to kind of put it behind me a little bit but there was parts of this that were still problems there was parts of this that were not figured out yet i had issues still that were that were not resolved and it was i think i think it was that part of the hero's journey i think it was that part of just standing up and saying i'm going to take responsibility and understanding what that meant because i'd never in my life fully had to take responsibility like of all the hating i did for my parents they provided for me they gave me a house i'd never had a fucking job you know dad would take me and give me work if i needed to work and all this type of stuff i do like manual labor with him and build houses and lift and put down floorboards and all this type of stuff but I never had to go and find a job for myself and never to go and worry about money I never to go and to do all these type of things all this stuff was like provided for effortlessly no problems whatsoever and they had sent me to a great school and all this type of stuff they like you know loan me the car when I needed and all these type of things and I go to college and then eventually I go in, out into the real world and I remember when I finally, I, I dropped out of college because college was a brainwashing camp. You know, I go in and day three is like, I'm learning about Karl Marx. Like someone's dropping the, literally going to college. Here's, here's, here's something about the modern world. Like Jesus Christ, my, you know, I go into college and one of the first text I'm introduced to is the communist manifesto wake up motherfuckers like why are you going into debt to do this type of stuff it's absolutely insane critical theory like of that that was knocking around when I was in college as well all Judith Butler all that stuff I was I was in there and I was saying this is this is baloney this is nonsense this is not doing me any good so I dropped out and I, I left this and I remember when I dropped out I was finally in the world by myself you know and I was sort of had to, I had to finally sort of be like, all right, how do I sort out money? What does it mean to sort out finances? What am I going to do? Like, who am I going to become? Like, what am I going to do here? And this was the first time that I was sort of stepping, putting the best foot forward and saying, right, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try to figure myself out and all this. And I remember at that point, all these emotions began to erupt up once again. And they were very difficult to deal with at this time, but this was almost like the final boss. You know, it was like I was summoning a demon and finally beating him. And it was like the childlike resentment was getting overcome at this moment. And so I step out into the world and I'm confronted with the most brutal thing of all. So like when your dad's security goes and your dad's guidance goes and your dad's money goes and your mom's comforting and loving and all that stuff, and that's gone and they're gone and you're just, it's just you and the world you very quickly realize that you're not good enough. It's crushing, it's horrible, it's hard, but you're a young kid, you step out and you realize that like people are just not gonna give you cash unless you're competent, unless you can provide something for them. You're like, things just don't work out in your favor unless you're good enough. You simply have to be able to act competently and professionally and skilled. You have to overcome yourself. You have to impose discipline upon yourself. You can't sleep in until, you know, 11 a.m. every single day and play PlayStation all day. You just can't do that shit because you go broke, because you become a loser. You can't just sit around and party all day. I was in college, 
you know parents paying for the college and I'm here fucking drinking the whole time and like experimenting with drugs and l- listening to art and staying up to 3am every night watching fucking movies and all this saying that I'm getting cultured and doing all this shite and then of course you go out into the real world and you can't do any of that stuff you need to be a performer you need to be on your game you need to take infinite responsibility you need to show up every single day you need to work you need to learn how to eat clean so that you're high energy so that you can continue this momentum on all these type of things and all of this stuff I had to do and I was very very quickly confronted with the problem that I am not good enough I'm not skilled enough I'm not capable of just generating wealth I'm not artistically skilled enough in order to succeed in my dreams I'm not I'm not I'm not healthy enough I'm struggling all these type of things I had all these problems coming up I was confronted with the crushing realities of life and life started to beat down on me and I started to fail I was having money problems I was struggling to succeed in my dreams and put myself out there nobody gave a fuck about who I was nobody knew me I'd gone from this position where I was hanging out with all these people I was like cool and cool in school hanging out with all these people doing really really well and now I'm just like you know going from being like in the school system and education system being cool getting all the chicks all this type of stuff and now it's like reset I'm not I'm at the very bottom I'm like a fucking the most useless dork ever like a zero on the scale again and I start this process of of trying to build myself up, but all these titanic, monstrous, resentful emotions came up again because I started. And it's so interesting, the logic of how you think. You say to yourself, I'm not good enough because I've not been built properly. I was not educated properly. I was not trained properly. And you say to yourself, I'm in this position. I'm sleeping on a fucking mattress in the middle of Dublin. I'm, you know, feeling terrible probably because I'm not eating properly. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't feel good enough. People aren't rewarding me with wealth or attention or success. I'm fucking struggling here, man. I am broke. I don't know what's going on. And and you, you, you realize it's like, it's because I'm not good enough and you hate admitting that to yourself, but that's what you can see. And then you start to get depressed and you start to say to yourself, why am I not good enough? And it's like, well, because I, I, if I had grown up in this education system, if my dad had taken more responsibility and trained me properly with all the skills I needed, I would have went out into the world at 18, 19, whatever age I was, and just started succeeding straight away and everything would have been easy. You start to imagine this alternative utopia where everything went perfect and everything went easy. And you start to imagine how your dad or your, your this person could have acted in order to put you in that position. And you start to resent them then for not acting like that. And you say, you know, this is a big deal for me is sort of thinking about my dad and being like you know if you educate my mom and my dad if you did your job right and you acted perfectly like angelic gods of the masculine and the feminine I would have turned out like this and become like a you know a golden child and everything would have been easy and it would have never never been any struggle and everything would have been fine for me and all this stuff and this this dark resentment came up again and it was fury it was titanic fury because I felt like someone else had wasted my potential and of course it wasn't my fault I was just waking up here at 19 and I was an innocent angel child who was trying my best and wanted the best and I was of course getting thwarted by my incompetent parents my lazy parents who made the bad decisions the same pattern coming up again and it was their fault and this dark aggressive resentment showed up again and again it, the way I projected it on them was the same thing I started having that aggression that that nastiness these patterns of nasty thoughts towards them hate like I remember saying I hate you to them before it's like such a horrific horrible thing to say and I have to overcome this this is almost like the foundation of the first step of my journey is this demon summons up and this you could call it a trauma you could call it some type of chthonic emotion that I've not dealt with it's resentment it's this spite it's this vengeance and it was floating around me and it came up and it was not going to go away because in order for me to succeed I needed to overcome my resentment and say to myself like it's it's like Nietzschean fatalism I need to I need to affirm my life as it is right in front of me and say to myself right as I, as life appears in front of me I'm going to affirm it I'm going to make the most of this situation I maybe will not articulate um, the apotheosis of my perfect potential I maybe won't achieve godhood in this lifetime but what I'm going to try to achieve is the most out of my potential starting from this point going forward I'm going to assume maximum responsibility for my situation and I'm going to learn and I'm going to train and this is a great credit to me because it's great credit to my parents because dad would always say this stuff to me it's so interesting that you only realize the good things after you start to think the right way but dad would always say stuff like you know take responsibility he was he, he would always say very interesting things like you know I would always say oh I can't do this I can't do that and like almost like a half joke because Irish people are like this you never know if they're actually being serious he would say there's no such thing as can't and I was I would always you know you'd be a kid and you'd be like you know especially my parents like my dad my dad's side of the family they're just speaking riddles they're, Irish people are like this 
this or you just you don't even know what's real or, or, and all this type of stuff but he would say that stuff sometimes and I'd always you know you'd sit there and you'd be like what the fuck did he mean and that's an interesting thing there's no such thing as can't you can do anything this these these type of mindsets he had installed them inside of me like little software coding programs but they've been stored away and blocked the resentment was like this virus that had stopped them from activating but then at some point I'm sitting down and I'm stewing and I'm angry and these ideas begin to pop up and it's so fascinating because I probably didn't even credit them to him because I was so bitter and resentment uh, resentful so instead I just sort of imagined they popped out of my angelic soul I came up with this idea but of course it was coming from his programming of me and I start to believe right I can do it I can figure it out I can do it and I remember this, these these type of mindsets and mind frames started to, to grow in me and I started to cultivate them and I'm figuring all this shit out by myself like use, use motherfuckers now with self help YouTube and Jordan Peterson and all this shit telling you to take responsibility I had to figure this shit by myself man I had to figure out I had to let the chthonic power of my collective my, my unconscious erupt out of me and show me the path I had to go on my own self journey you fuckers when you can sit there and say I'm watching YouTube videos I'm improving whereas I had to let the software programs activate from within me but they did and they switched on and I started to I started to believe this stuff and I started to take action upon it and I started to work and I started to try to build my capacity and I started started to focus on my skill development and all these type of things. And eventually I got better and better and better over the years. It took a long time, but I started to develop competence. I got better at speaking. I started to read. I became well-educated and re- well-read. Most people I knew who were going on the same path were becoming mal-educated. They were getting turned into Marxists, reading Judith Butler. They were not learning any practical skills at all. They're becoming less competent, staying perpetually in the education system I had now dropped out I was going to people like mentors I was going to uh, public speakers poets musicians I was tr- like paying them to train me I was going into athletics I was learning to fight I was doing all these type of things I was going out and socialising I was learning like figuring out how to talk to people how to get, get myself out into the world learning all these type of skills all this type of stuff and eventually it led to me succeeding and me doing very very well and like I'm doing as good as anybody I know especially from back in the day and all that type of stuff now the point of this is not like I'm some fucking genius and all this type of stuff but it's more that at that point I had fine I, I basically said to myself that it's it's even hard to describe was this a moment but I began to just become proactive with I'm going to take responsibility I'm going to own this life in front of me I'm going to affirm this life in front of me exactly as it is the circumstance is not ideal but I'm going to make the most of it and this is what's so fascinating is that that then aligned with me deciding to become myself to figure my own voice to figure my own strategy forward this actually was the source of my creativity then because I actually also had a problem during this resentful period where I was trying to act like other people because there was this constant hate of myself I constantly said to myself that I'm not good enough and my style is not cool I'm some dork country boy with no authenticity this was always sort of a theme I go into you know the 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 groups and I'm the outsider and I'm not cool and all these type of things and I'm you know I, I don't have a voice and so I have to copy I've talked about this before I have to copy like Jeff Buckley or these other singers in order to find my voice and I have to act like other people in order to find out who I am act like people I think are cool and then when I started to take responsibility when I started to say to myself I'm going to own all this I'm going to stop resenting I'm going to stop saying to myself my problems are a consequence of my parents my parents did the best job they could you know maybe they could have got things better in some way but fuck it it is what it is let's make the most out of it it's time for me to take the baton on and start sprinting because I'm like you know it's like they were in a race and they ran with the baton and then they got to me and I just kind of sat down and I just took the baton I was like fuck's sake like you could have ran faster and it's like why don't you just start running sorry I screwed up on some level but I got here you know just start running yourself let how it's your turn now please continue and this is what what sort of happens and so I, I, I took that on and I overcame the resentment and it was the burst of creativity came from this. I, it was like a Jungian shadow experience. I began being able to make stuff. I began to be able to find my own voice. I began to be able to find my own style, my own story. I be, came into myself as a man. And all of a sudden it was so fucking profound. Like those emotions, that knotted resentment just evaporates. It just vanishes. You know, I think about it, I, I reflect on it and I start to feel, it, it starts to morph into this sort of guilt and shame. 
shame. This introspection is like, what the fuck was I doing? How was I being so ungracious? It starts to uh, it turn into appreciation. It starts to me to understand and, and see. It's like, it's like you know, a, a bigger part of myself opens up and I can empathize. I'm able to see the struggle that my parents went through in order to create what they needed to create. And then I mature, you know, I become more responsible and I overcome all this type of stuff. And I basically step forward into my life and set my own destiny and take responsibility for it. And this is it. Like, this is this psychology in its essence. This is so, so important for changing your life. Because when you think about it, that resentment is such a thorn in your side. It stifles you from becoming creative. It holds you back so much because it held me back so much. It crushed me. It stopped me from fulfilling my potential. It was the major thing holding me back. And the, the what it really was, was my refusal to take responsibility and become creative about my situation, to launch my best self upon the world. Instead, I wanted to hold it back and blame others for why I could not flourish, to remain in a position of escape escape and project my blame onto someone else so I never have to stand up and put my best foot forward to escape the true hero's journey the true joy the true creative path that was laid out in front of me and this is what I'm here to talk to you about today now this is my personal story this is how resentment is like a demon that haunted me and it's something that I had to conquer and overcome and it was a great great foundation to my mental health going forward in the rest of my life and it was something that was very very difficult it was crushing it left me depressed it was a big part of me developing a character developing my personality it was very important it was part of me maturing and growing up as I've said now the thing is is that I'm an individual my psychology you know pretty insignificant in the scale of things. What does it matter? What's the big deal? But what you see is that if you get a billion people like me and they're all possessed by that same resentment and they can't overcome this, you can see how that demon starts to gain an immense amount of force. What if there was four, five, six billion people on this earth that were possessed by this resentment and it started to spin inside of them and twist them and cause them to be uncreative, to be reactive, to be stuck in the knot of their resentment and to be blaming somebody else and not taking responsibility and not becoming creative, not putting their best foot forward, not trying to manifest their potential, and instead getting aggressive and angry and trying to pull people down and project that hate upon people um, because of their own failures. Imagine what that what type of world that would be like. And this is why Nietzsche was trying to tell us that resentment is tied to the future potential and the destiny of the whole world. If resentment overcomes mankind, it will pull mankind down into the darkness and the idiocy and the, 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 the failure. Like resentment is an evil, chthonic, downward pulling emotion that will pull us into um, something horrible. You know, you can make a very, very harsh argument. A lot of Christians really, really struggle to think about this stuff, but it's a very, very interesting thing to think about is that Rome was the Roman generals and the conquerors, the masters, the Roman, you know, super creators built this huge Roman society and they got really, really greedy and they started to pull in all these immigrants, all these migrants, very similar to what's going on now, you know, the whole open borders thing. So all these Roman elites say, all right, open the borders and let's bring in all these slaves. And they, they took in all these slaves from the Middle East, the Levant, the North Africa, Greece, um, the Balkans. They just took everybody in and they created this melting pot multicultural society and they're like, we're all going to make you Roman. Roman's this multicultural identity. And they shove everybody into it. And it becomes this churning up crazy chthonic melting pot. And nobody has an identity inside of this. And the only identity that they share is that they are all slaves. They're all these different ethnicities with these di different histories, these different backgrounds. But they're all slaves. That's all they are. They're all slaves who are beaten by the Romans. You have this tiny minority of Romans who have been mastered, who, who mastered all these slaves and put them in and put them to work. And the Romans' greed means that they want to build this, you know, almost like a cancer cell, this giant super society of Rome. They just keep on bringing in more slaves until eventually they have like a million slaves in there who make up the Roman populace. And they come up with all these ideas of like, all right, we'll create this new Roman identity that will sol solve all these problems. But like a r calling someone Roman is not going to give them catharsis over the deep, deep black resentment you have towards somebody who conquers you. Because me being mad at my parents is like, you know, kind of timid in the scale of things. But imagine if I, you know, the people who I was angry at were actually an oppressor, were actually holding me back. Like my parents were literally fighting for me. They were literally on my side, like as the most you could imagine. They're my parents and look how mad I got. Imagine if you had somebody who was not on your side, who was actually going against you, had done something terrible to you, to, to enslave you. 
That resentment would become this sort of genius, this devious spirit, this giant god, like the way people would describe gods of old. This is what it would be like, a collective consciousness, a collective spirit. And what an awful lot of people, like what Nietzsche would say and many people around his era were saying is that this resentment morphed and became sort of organized in Rome because you had all these slaves and the only way that they could bond is upon this new identity which Christianity gave them because Jesus of course was a slave Jesus was a Jew who was part of Judea and Judea was one of the conquered races and he was a representative of the foreigner the foreigner who had been killed the foreigner who'd been hurt and it was this great way for the for the, the, the immigrants, the people, the slaves who had been brought in to, to complain to the Romans and try to make the Romans conscious and be like, listen, it was like me projecting that hate upon my parents. It's like, look, look how much you've hurt me. Look at what you've done to me. Look at the way your, your, your aggression and your, your, your decisions and your inconsiderateness has hurt me. Look at this. And so Jesus is like this symbol that you can shove in the face of the great Romans. You can be like, look, look at the harm you're calling, causing us. Look at, look at what you are. You're evil. You're wrong. And you try to create inside of the Roman hesitation. You try to create inside of the Roman doubt. The Roman doubts himself and says, oh my God, what if I'm the bad guy? What if I'm evil? What if me conquering and building Rome was actually bad all along? And it creates this 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 hesitation and this guilt complex. And this, this relationship is extremely important because the resentment is designed to create a mind state of hesitation, guilt, and maybe even create the pain inside the Roman. And so the Christians, they, they come in, it becomes this really powerful identity that allows all of these confused, this hodgepodge of confused races to understand themselves and unite as a consciousness. And so the Roman identity actually collapses completely because it's not sufficient to answer this deep emotion inside people. But the Christian identity succeeds because it is a strong enough category to suit the resentment. It's It, it literally matches that perfectly. This is why Nietzsche called it a slave morality because it suits the core emotion of the slaves, which is resentment. And so the Romans, the, the, the Christians unify together and then they start projecting Thing. They get organized and all this resentment then gets projected up like a communist revolution, you know, or a French revolution gets projected up at these Romans and they can be pulled out of their position of power and they can be demanded. It's like, you're Roman, you're evil, you're the people who killed Christ. Get out, move out, get, get rid of your pagan gods. We're in power now. We're in charge now because we're the noble ones. We get to make the decisions, all these type of things. They seize power, they overturn the Romans and they take it. And then what happens is when they gain power over Roman society, they get all the institutions of Rome, they get the rights to make all the decisions. And when in 40 years, Rome collapses, Rome falls apart. And when it falls apart, there's this like this crazy, crazy psychosis of destruction that goes down. Christianity takes control and then immediately book burning start. The libraries start getting torn apart. Everything gets gets slandered as pagan. Everything starts to get pulled down. They pull down all these grand statues. Imagine if like, you know, some some left wing communist revolution took over Italy and started to pull down the, the statue of David by Michelangelo and all these type of things. And these great symbols of incredible achievements of the Renaissance because it was like, you know, fascist or Republican or conservative or some nonsense that they're coming up with and they're saying you know high art is somehow some political thing because it's just resentment against the achievements of the thing that they wanted to destroy this is exactly what it was like and so Rome was pulled down all these statues were destroyed and crushed because they represented Romanists they represented the, the, the master who had conquered them and so their deep chthonic resentment erupted onto the world and they annihilated everything and they wiped Rome off the face of the earth and transformed us into the dark age and this was the like they destroyed all the science Science that came along with it and all the engineering. There was a point in history where the Gauls and the French and the early Europeans, the early medieval Europeans would walk around and look at the aqueducts and kind of ponder and like be like, nobody knew how they were even built. They had no idea how to repair them. So they used to just take some of the stones off them. But these things just stood as this almost like this skeleton of something amazing that they just can't remember anymore. It just used to be there. The ruins sat around as something um, nostalgic for something that used to be there. And this is an example of how dark, how deep, how powerful that resentment is when it becomes conscious, when it becomes massive, when it becomes genius. It can launch itself upon things and destroy things in orgies of destruction. Every great revolution that you see in the last couple of centuries has had this core emotion at the root of it. The French Revolution. We like to think of the French Revolution. This is very hard for people to, to really think about because it burst many beautiful bubbles on us. We like to think of the French Revolution as this beautiful moment where we achieved freedom and liberty and it was the, the the flowering of the modern free liberal 
consensus and perspective on the world, which is the foundation for many of our values. But of course, this is why Nietzsche is so powerful, because he's an actual free, liberal, creative, open-minded thinker. He sees things from different perspectives. He's able to sit down and actually critique the values upon which we've built our society and ask some very difficult questions about this. But most people aren't honest enough to do this. For example, many of the resentful people who you might categorize as liberal or left nowadays, they, they can't do this in any way because they're some of the shallowest people who've ever lived. And you look at these and you start to see all these features and it's very easy to see this stuff when you're looking for it you look at the french revolution you'd like to say to yourself that it's something beautiful and amazing but it wasn't the french revolution was ugly and covered in horrific blood it was it was clearly this exact exact catonic emotion you had the Catholic monarchs and the church that, that they, they had this power system constructed, this hierarchy. And these guys had been chads. They had been conquerors. These had been the, the Germanic people who had come out of the forest of Germany after Rome fell. And they had mastered the peasantry. They had mastered the conquered races of Rome. So when Rome fell apart, they came in and they had conquered and created the peasantry and established a feudal system that allowed them to create this space, this free space on top of them, that they could harvest the resources off the peasantry and they could use these resources is to individuate. And this is what Western culture was. They created the West. They created the Catholic Christian High West. This is where all the great architecture, all the great cathedrals, all the great music, all that stuff came from this era of consciousness, this period of time, this way of seeing the world. And of course, the, in, in France, France was the most successful country in Europe. It was the first country established in Europe, established by Char Charlemagne, the first real empire put together after that. And then it became the most successful one. When the French Revolution happened, basically France France was um, one of the most populous countries in all of Europe. It was huge. You know, it was a really, really big place, really successful. And of course, that successful meant that this massive society grew, this huge millions and millions of people living in France. And of course, they have a problem where they're the undercast. You have this royal aristocracy who are like divine right of kings. We are so much better than you that you're not even the same, you know, you're not even the same class as us. We're like, an, 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 we're on another level. They're like rappers that are walking around the whole time, dressing all fancy, being like, we're just on another level. We're on a different game. We're not the same. You know, you're below us and all this. And so they feel that resentment. If they have any struggles in their life, they're like, all oh, those fucking kings, you know, they trip up. They're like me when they shove the spoke in the, in the, shove the stick and the bicycle spoke and fall over they're like oh the fucking king did that to me again you know they get mad about this they get angry they're like we want representation we we want to change the world and so they come up with this chant of liberty this chant of fraternity this chant of equality they 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 discuss how they want to bind together as a nation create this unified mass consciousness as this giant unit which we call being french french nationalism this is the arrival of nationalism nationalism was a left-wing movement there's a red pill and a half and it arrived Arrives as this big group consciousness, and this group consciousness is bound upon resentment. It's that chthonic force that pulls them all together, how they understand themselves. That's one of the core emotional foundations. We, as a French nation, define ourselves as the people, and the people's core driving spirit is the hate for the aristocrats, the hate for the royals. And of course, this it's we sell ourselves this always as something beautiful, just like I sat down there when I was a kid, and I told myself that I'm special and I've got this noble quest in the world to become great and to become appreciated and all these type of things and I'm the most important person in the world and my silly parents are in the way and they're holding me back and they're these evil, demonic, blunt, dumb, silly people who've do, do, who are constantly sabotaging me and getting in my way and so my emotions are justified and I'm on this beautiful story and my need to escape and my my anger is justified and noble in fact pr profound my profound aggression and anger it is a great feeling that I feel all this and you see this then inside this French nationalist movement is that they've they beautify they beautify their aggression they beautify their their fury it's it's for equality it's not for the truth it's not for the fact that they are many of them are just darkly negative it's not like that many of them are just blunt resistant resentful losers. It's not like that at all. Many of these people just don't take responsibility. They're immature. They're aggressive because they won't stand up and become creative. They're not psychologically developed. And obviously most people are not going to develop. Most people are going to struggle with this because it's hard to become better. Most people are lazy. Most people choose the weaker path. And so what happens is this mass consciousness forms and then they turn around and they, they direct that hate towards the the, the rich, the, towards the, the aristocrats. And they charge up to towards the aristocrats and then they pull them out and they, you know, this beautiful idea 
blossoms and it turns into an orgy of violence. They go up and they pull the king out of his chambers and they cut his fucking head off and they pull women, you know, princesses and they make, you know, they talk all crazy shit about her, calling her a whore. They did this to loads of them. Marie Antoinette is a very famous one. And then they go and uh, they make all these, you know, make up all these rumors about her being sexualized and stuff like that. And then they cut off her head. They murder a woman, you know. And then they, they murder, they just go in this butchery of murdering the, all the royals. And loads of them, it's just, it's just a bloodbath, basically. It's absolutely insane. And then, of course, this is, you know, you could sort of say, well, that's the transition of power. It's the way the world works. Maybe, maybe that's fair enough. But then it gets even worse because then they establish power. The resentful have seized their power and then they sit down, they establish power. They're like, I have power now. I have power now. And then what the, what happens is Robespierre, one of the main leaders, sits down and he's of like you know he's sort of the, the he's 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 economizing he's using this spirit of resentment he's one of the savvy archons he's one of the preachers of equality one of these people who understand how dumb and stupid and naive the the many are he understands how to exploit resentment and he knows how to speak to the simplicity of the people and so he goes around and he starts to say okay well listen you're not really revolutionary enough. You're not really resentful enough. You don't believe in equality. As George Orwell so magnificently put it, some men are equal, but all... All men are equal, but some men are more equal than others. That's what it was. And uh, he he says this, and then he starts to butcher people. And then what happens? There's a reign of terror. All of a sudden, Robespierre and the French Revolution transforms into this chthonic madness, this psychosis of death. And they start to murder all these people around them. They kill, they kill, they kill the blood. The ugly, demonic, serial killer face comes on. And you realize that it's just blunt resentment. These people aren't creative. They don't want to solve problems. They don't want to sit down and do the hard work of building something, of manifesting something, of, of making something magical happen. Instead, they want to murder. They want to express because they've just got a demon inside of them. They've got that dense negative energy inside of them and they're just trying to project it out somewhere. And you even give them power and that negative energy will just manifest and they'll just start blaming if there's any problems because there will be problems. They'll just start shooting that in whatever fucking direction they can find and they'll cause pain and they'll cause psychosis and they'll hurt people and they'll cause damage they'll project that pain and this is what Nietzsche means when he says be careful of the weak be careful of the resentful be careful of giving the slave power even though they're complaining that they deserve it be careful because when they get that power they will launch that resentment that they've had to hold back and it will be uglier and more intense than anything you've ever seen the greatest haters are always these people who suffer from this cruelty when they get that power something turns in them and they get that festering their eyes go red and they feel that they can finally release that tension that they've been holding up all that time and this is where you get these type of people who get inventive get creative in their cruelty you know this is where they start to say all right well how can we do something horrific something brutal how can we enact inside of them endless pain because remember what i said about my parents i wanted them to submit i wanted them to break i wanted mom to be like you know prostylize herself on the floors and be like oh woe is me i'm so terrible i'm the worst I fucked your life up. I'm terrible. You want you want her to break down, but it was bottomless. It was an endless, endless anger and endless hate because if she had got down and she had proselytized herself, there would have been no catharsis for me. There would have been no alleviation for me because I needed to conquer that in myself. The way that I could transform that emotion is to become creative myself. So if she bends down and submits, there's nothing, that wouldn't have been enough for me and I would have needed something new and I would have needed something more. And this is what we mean by this. You give the weak man the the sword you give him the weak man the army and he will do incredible things to express hate through this because there's no end to his hate there's no way that that hate can get the catharsis that it needs to so it just gets worse and worse and worse it just spirals out of control it becomes more and more blunt and more and more butcherous and this is what happens with Robespierre and of course what happens then in the communist revolution all the same patterns all the same stuff. The great maturity of Western man is he needs to start to learn about this an awful lot more because they, they did this in Russia and it's happening again. This resentment is always going to form up again and there'll always be these dirty little archons who are going to exploit this resentment. There's always going to be those people who understand that this is a source of power and they are going to use it to their advantage. These are these cro crooked little conniving fucks who are going to do this stuff and try to hurt you. And this is what happened in the communist revolution. They all went in and they started to preach. They started to talk about equality to the resentful masses. They said preachers, the preachers of equality 
Fidelity came in and said they stirred up the resentment in the failures, in the botched, in the people who were unsuccessful, the majority, the many people who were struggling. And they weren't intent on helping these people because, of course, many of these systems actually try to help these people. But no, they just wanted to fire up this resentment so they could create this massive national consciousness inside this body politic. And then they could begin to use that. And of course, what did this turn into in practice? They gained power. And then, of course, it became the repossession phase. So this is when they started to send all these botched degenerates to go and rape the farmer's daughters and hang the farmer in the kitchen and then, you know, steal all his food and steal his, steal his house and all these type of things. And then came the NKVD. And what you do, you create this institution and it's projected with this psychotic hate. And the hate is allowed to flow. And all of a sudden, that beautiful equality, that beautiful story, oh, wow, that's so amazing. With that beautiful mask, the mask comes off and you see the cold, glassy, dead eyes. You see that energy inside Patrick Bateman. Oh, everybody's sharing the Patrick Bateman American Psycho mean. You see that show up where it's the glassiness, the emptiness, where they're, they're filled with that fury where they just want blunt, aggressive, endless, bottomless hate. They just want to break you. They want to tear your skin off. They want to see you bleed. They want to see you suffer. There's no, they don't even want you dead. They just want you in, in knots of pain. That's what it's all about. And there's no purpose to it. There's no end goal. There's no creative point to it. It's just that spiraling downwards. And of course, communism eventually falls apart because it's predicated on this type of psychotic energy. It's like a demon erupted and created this cancer. It's like what cancer does to the body, you know? Cancer goes in this rebellion. It grows inside of your body, it starts to absorb all the energy from the other cells, but it has no goal, it has no intention, it has no knowledge, it has no sense about itself. It's incredibly intelligent, incredibly surreal. It's like an alien where it comes up with all these innovative ways to trick your immune system to not be able to see and understand the protein markers so that your immune system can't dissolve the cancer and eat it. So, what happens is it just keeps on growing, but what's its point? What's its goal? Nobody knows. It just grows and it spreads and it grows and it spreads and it grows and it spreads, and eventually it kills the host and then it dies as well. It just takes the whole thing down with it. And what is it? It's just in a psychosis of, it's just it's just pure madness. It doesn't know what it's doing. It has no purpose. It's just this sort of psychotic, neurotic greed. It's a demon. It's a blunt negative energy that is aimed at one thing and one thing only, which is propagating itself and spreading, spreading the hate. So I'm going to talk to you about what it is to be Irish so we can bring this conception up to the modern. So talking about myself, talking about history, how could you see this resentment appear in the modern world? What do we have to learn? Because this is going to be the thing that's going to stifle our identity. This is the thing that's going to hold us back the most. Like our future is 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 null. Our future is fucked if we don't overcome this. This is actually the most serious thing. But people have so many psychological blocks towards dealing with this because it's very difficult to deal with an emotion that's at this depth of our soul. It is so foundational to who who some of us are. Look at me. Like I'm trying to describe me, and I can believe me, man. You wouldn't have been able to sit down and explain this shit to me because it was too dark. It was too heavy. It's so fucking hard to actually see through the gauze. It's like you're possessed. It's like you, you've got this weird blinder in your perspective and you're just delusional. And you're, as I said, you're possessed by hate. It's very, very hard to see through this stuff. And there's billions of people out there that are just driven by this resentment at the moment. And it, it's always the case, really. What really has to happen among mankind is his consciousness needs to move past this sort of soft, and um, delusional, beautiful idea paradigm, which we, I guess we could call the liberal paradigm, and evolve to a more psychologically sophisticated paradigm where we understand emotions like resentment better. We understand that this is something that predicates and drives many of the people in this world. Or else we're in trouble because we're going to get pulled down just like Christianity pulled down Rome. And that's really what I'm trying to stress. You have to see the negative of this. Like the, the Romans failing to d deal with the resentment of the, of the slaves that they brought in. Their greed combined with their failure to deal with the resentment resentment of the slaves they brought in led to the collapse of their empire and a dark age that lasted a thousand years. The communist revolution was not fucking good for the people who were the kulaks. It was not good. It ended up in death, murder, millions of people died on a mass scale because of these type of things. These type of revolutions are really important to understand because this is resentment expressed on the mass level. Now, I see this resentment very intimately because I'm Irish. And 
Nietzsche is like the sort of he's like a vaccine for the Irish consciousness, you know, <laughs> because he's he comes in and he starts to explain these things. And it's just so jarring if you're Irish because you grow up in a resentful culture. You grow up in a culture which is slave conscious. The Irish were slaves for a thousand years underneath the foot of the English. That's probably one of the longest lengths of slavery of all time. And of course, you develop this bitter, resentful slave consciousness before them. And Nietzsche is always trying to explain to you like, how do overcome these negative uh, negative experiences. He's like some type of weird incel therapist who lives in a mountain that talks to like, you know, the super consciousness, the collective unconscious instead of you. He's sitting there, you know, acting like some type of weirdo sitting on his couch telling you, yeah, you're, you're, you've got slave morality. And you're like, what? That's not even, you just made that up, man. He's like, yeah, I did, but I'm creative. You'd be able to create things if you weren't a slave as well. He explains to us the slave core, the slave's core emotion is resentment. The slave's core emotion is resentment. You have to think about this. You have to meditate on this so deeply. It's so profound. The thing that marks slavery is resentment. It doesn't even matter if you overcome your slavery situation. If you're still possessed by that resentment, there's something wrong. The slave's whole identity is built around hate for his oppressor. And what I see in the Irish has been stirred up again with the queen dying, you know? Because think about it. What happened with the queen? Is the queen a bad woman? Is the queen, you know, like, is the, did the queen enslave us? Maybe the institution of royalty, did they enslave us? Maybe, you know, you could stretch that if you want, but apparently we're free. But the queen is, like, basically the queen's just an old woman. You know, she's not, she's not, she's not a tyrant. She's just an old woman, you know. And I saw people after she died, like, you know, celebrate. Yes, fuck the queen. Fuck her. Fuck Lizzie. And you're kind of, you know, it kind of hits you. And when you see it, you're like, that's fucked up, man. Like, what, what's, like, it's, it's, it's weird, man. It's dark. It's ugly. It's crude. She's no fucking woman. And she died. And it's not like, you know, death is death. You got to have a bit of respect about these type of things. You got to kind of keep a bit of a distance to it. I'd like, even if I was the, an Irish nationalist back in the day, fighting to free my people, I'd be angry at the army. I'd be fighting the army. I'm not going to really give a fuck if like some royal old woman dies of natural causes. It's not like, what, what has that got to do with anything? What is projecting hate onto her? This is, this is a weird thing. It's, it's like, think of it in terms of war and you're fighting in a war. There's still honor there's still this idea of acting that you're you know you're 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 engaging in a sort of spiritual competition to decide to, to where reality comes in you're deciding who is going to be righteous by the person who's most competent in the realm of the battle of war and hate maybe comes into it a little bit you're like angry and you're hateful of your 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 competitor and you want to beat them but at the same time, you can transcend that kind of blunt resentment and still sort of nobly conduct war, nobly conduct a fight. But in this instance, you see this, you see this pettiness. You see this pettiness in these Irish people, these cowards like who would never, you know, fucking go and fight in a war themselves, celebrating Lizzie's death, celebrating Queen Elizabeth dying, celebrating an old woman dying. It's like, what, what the fuck is this Irish nationalism thing all about? What does it mean to be Irish then? If you're just going to be a salty little freak who's like celebrating an old woman and dying it's so pathetic now people don't think about this but you know in your normal life that hate poisons the hater as much as the target we irish we have every reason to hate these these english you always have no reason when you're oppressed the english did have their foot in us they starved us with the famine this is all absolutely true but nietzsche is so fucking harsh when he says like you know we've all we've we've all got problems bro you know we've all had stuff that's fucked us up but sitting down and being bitter about it ain't going to change anything the mark of greatness is being able to overcome the pain, the trauma, the hate, being able to overcome the problems and become creative. That's what it is. And look at the story in my life. I had all the reasons. Oh, yeah, maybe my parents, my parents fucked up. They didn't make perfect choices. You know, they maybe they're moving a kid during the peak years of his development, trying to make friends. Maybe that was dumb. You know, maybe it was dumb. But Jesus Christ, like, what, what are they going to, are they supposed to be like the dart player who just keeps on hitting, you know, triple twenties every single time? Like, it's just, it just doesn't happen. You have to overcome that stuff. You have to learn to affirm the situation and adapt and become creative. And you notice this in Irish culture is that like, we, we struggle with this. We really, really struggle with this. We have to build our identity off the anti-Englishness. And it's, it's weak. It's, it's not good. It's a terrible, terrible emotional consciousness. 
All throughout my life, I was taught to hate. And not in a way that you would think. It's like done in a subtle way. It's collective unconscious, you know? So little quips by my family and friends about how arrogant and dumb the English are all the time. Like this, you know, the English would never come up with a, a, a good statement beside of them. They'd always have, there'd be like this tone. Oh, the English, you know, or like, oh, the English are at it again. Brexit is a great story about this. Like, you know, when Brexit happened, it's like, Everything was Brexit's fault. Everything. And you know, like the same thing. You're you're driving down and you stick a you put a stick in the wheels of your bicycle and you fall over and you're like, oh fucking Brexit. Like it's that type of vibe. I remember when that came around and everyone, all my family members, a load of my friends would be giving out about it the whole time about the fucking English, arrogant English thinking that they can have their own country, arrogant English be with their Brexit and all this type of stuff. And it's just like, you know, it's like what the fuck are you even talking about, you fucking losers? Like you're you're a dork, you're a loser. Like, why do you care about Brexit? it and this is all wrapped up then with this grand story of how they kept us down so like why do the irish not succeed the irish actually have a loser consciousness it's, it's maybe hard for people to understand but um, conor mcgregor was such a, a force for the irish people because he has this weird way of thinking like he doesn't think like an irish person conor conor has this like he's almost like a sort of psychotic compensation for how Irish consciousness actually is because Irish consciousness is very you know like ah don't be trying that don't be thinking you're a winner Asher ah, no, that's not you you know that's not us we don't win we're slaves we're pathetic we're losers and so the Irish consciousness is like n not not success and Connor comes along and he's like he's like an, an American he's like everything everything's possible everything's optimistic we can win we can do it it we can say big things and achieve them we're, we've got winner consciousness we're gonna work we're gonna build we're gonna become creative I'm gonna create my destiny the, this this stuff is just fucking weird for Irish people like th there's a phrase that you would say you call um, like you know the, the midlands of Ireland or the, the, the countryside of Ireland the graveyard of ambition because this is it it's like if you have ambition it's like you're not you, you don't fit in you're not right. You're not right for this place. And so Connor comes along and he's like got this manifestation where he's crafting his identity. He's talking about like the secret and all this woo-woo shit. And he's going out and beating the shit out of people. And he's Irish. It's like, what? And so we feel something titanic erupt inside of us. This feeling of being alongside of a creative winner. It's amazing. And, and the whole Irish got all caught up with him and absolutely fell in love with him. And then, of course, when he started to go through his problems, you know, that resentment starts to show up and people start to say, oh, well, he's fuck Art O'Connor and all this type of stuff. And they, they turn on him, you know, the disloyalty comes out and you go back into slave consciousness and you start to hate him because he's winning, because he's succeeding, because he's driving around in his yacht. And it's like, you know, fair play to him. He's done all right with himself, this type of stuff. And of course, there's always this predicate, this assertion that we're innocent and magical and that these British people, these winners, they're demons. Like I'm, oh, I'm a good person. I'm the nice person. I just need someone to blame. And our Irish story, we built it on this great idea that we fought this war to become free. This is our great story. And it was a great story. Like, we had these manly characters like Michael Collins, these organizers who wrapped up this nation and stirred up that resentment and used it to win our freedom and gave us that power to become, to take on the world's greatest power and establish the Irish nation, establish the Irish identity. We had the poets like Yeats, all this type of stuff. We did incredible things. We were outnumbered, we were outgunned all these type of things and we won and we set ourselves free for the first time in a thousand years it's an amazing story it's it's something else to look at it and look at how the irish identity was crafted how we created the the celtic consciousness the americans nowadays absolutely love this stuff but the thing is is that that story's over that story's not like that's not what modern the modern world is like anymore that has passed and it's weird that we're sitting there and this resentment again think about being uncreative has got us caught up in a, a story from the past that we just can't get over we can't let it go and we can't adapt because creativity is essential because the world changes we've got new problems showing up this is something that i had to fucking learn you know how do you deal with change you can sit there and be bitter about it or you can adapt to the situation and learn to be creative. And so the world is changing an awful lot. And so our great struggle as Irish people to, to, to be, become free from the, the British, that was a big thing. But we are not the same anymore. We're not in the same position. You can think of this sort of politically like. The hate motivates us to fight the English, but that hate is now really misdirected. Like if all that it means to be an Irish person is to make fun of the royal family, to hate in the dead old woman, it's it's failed. It's pointless. It's over. Like what does it mean anymore? If the Irish identity is just to be a bitter little fuck, that's not a like that's done. That's um, we're out of that. Well, fuck that. Like what's the point in that? You know, that's not intelligent. That's not sophisticated. That's not creative. That's just pure resentment. 
That's just pure, uncreative, dead-end resentment. That's not going to go anywhere. Now, compare this to what's actually happening in the world right now. We see an organized super force. You could say a new manifestation of the British Empire, if you want, or as something that's fitting that archetype, that is the subtle power of global financial cabals. And they have obviously learned how to transcend national borders and nationalism and national states. And they've learned how to rinse these states using usury, debt-based finance, using foreign investments, big capital and stuff like this. And it's they've used they've they've mastered how to use things like subtle power, soft power, and they understand how to seep into these these countries and go in and buy up all their, their houses and all this stuff and do all these very interesting things where they transform the culture and transform the society in order to fit them into this new culture consciousness and this new plan that they want to push forward based on many new principles that we've talked about many, many times before. Now, if being Irish is hating the royal family, but not being able to see this, not being able to creatively manifest a new perspective and identity and understanding of thyself that allows you to openly seat yourself up against this, then it has failed. Then it is lost. This is what, how resentment holds you back. Resentment is the enemy towards seeing the world as it actually is. And the guys who ran our revolution and set us free, see, these were creative men. It's it's the, the glorious, beautiful paradox of life where you can have this small group of highly creative, motivated, excitable men even utilizing something like the resentment of the Irish in order to do something creative, which is create this nation, freedom, and give them this opportunity to have a destiny to go forward in the future. And of course, when the Irish got their freedom, there was this giant civil war about how exactly we should get our freedom. Like All these same patterns happen where the psychosis of the resentment and all the complexities of this stuff show up. But of course they fight and they try to retain their freedom and they warn us. They give us a grave warning. Podrick Pierce says this. He's like, look, if you free the nation, if we fight and free this nation and we don't free ourselves from the influence of global capital, of these big financial vultures, and they're just going to swoop in and they're going to fuck us up in the end anyway. They'll conquer our minds. If we don't free ourselves and get our own language sorted out, we're screwed. If we don't create our own separate culture and our separate identity, we'll get absorbed in the super super identity of the Anglo speak. And that obviously has happened. Ireland is starting to become Americanized, which is, you know, we're getting absorbed into a stronger culture, the stronger culture of the Americans, because the Americans are a highly creative people, this type of thing. And so there's also like many other things around this as well, because you're sitting down there and you're, you're like an Irish nationalist, you're fucking angry at the English, chanting about the Queen. This is just some big thing. And, you know, the, the stories I hear these people say in their heads that the Queen is a represent representation of fascism. She's some type of re conservative Republican. She's probably a Trump supporter. Like, you're just like, what are you even talking about? What are you What are you talking about? These people are so simple-minded and small-minded, making it about petty politics. And this is where they project all their anger. And they're like, oh, the reason why the world's in a bad place is because the character's like this. And you're like, you're just, you're just so, so slow. It's unbelievable. And the, the, the real problems sitting right in front of you are just far more subtle, are far more, far more intense, far more dif difficult to confront. Like Ireland, for example, is a wonderful place. It could feed 10 times its population. It is the abundant, an abundant space for nature and thriving. But we are destroying this heritage. Like we, we, we've been given a gold, one of the most fertile places in the fucking world best farmland in the world and we're destroying it because we're buying into all this globalized consci consciousness all this nonsense nonsense about these small creative organizations who are saying that we need to get into sustainability and we need to get on board with the multiculturalism stuff and we need to transform irish cultures you know so all these guys die in the post office they they die this is a big thing and the, we took over a post office and shot at the english all these guys put their bodies on the line take bullets get shot to set us free and then they fight to ba build this culture for ourselves the poets try to make irish culture the irish celtic identity and then what do you do 80 years afterwards is all you're doing is like tokenism giving out about the queen like a resentful little shit you're so uncreative you can't even make your own culture so you just get absorbed into the multicultural plan you become a sort of blob homogenized discount american and you see um and you cede the responsibility of your your, your country over to these like global institutions and global cabals and they transform it and make you all eat bugs and you can't even go and eat you know you, you have the most perfect place to have abundant meat and food and you just end up eating bugs anyway because you're a fucking dummy with a small minded consciousness and then what you get is these Irish cowards these just unimpressive people who own the English 
you know, because that's the safe thing to do. It's very safe to own the English. I don't think you realize, but half the fucking world is owning the English these days. Half the world is saying the English man, he's the big bad guy. He's the master race who conquered all of us. He's the colonist. He, we must destroy the English. The Irish cowards, we, we, we get on board with that and we chant with that. But that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. It doesn't mean it's adapting to reality as it is. It doesn't mean we're becoming creative. In fact, that means that we're engorging in the low consciousness resentment of the mob. That's what it means we're doing. And they, we, these cowards, they talk nothing about the real problem, about the, the, the goal to transform Ireland into something, to a, to a discount American shopping mall. They don't talk about that stuff. They don't talk about all the sacrifices we made to, to get our to get our freedom and our own destiny for us to just be absorbed in some other empire's destiny that we're not becoming aware of. And if all this is going to amount to is nothing more than t-shirts and bullshits, bullshit, we, we, we failed, we fucked up, it's nothing. And this is why resentment is sterile. It's empty, it's soulless, it has nothing to it. It has no direction. And this is why Nietzsche said, blessed are the forgetful, for they can get the better even of their mistakes. What a beautiful quote. Because in some sense, you have to say to yourself, get the fuck over it. You have to be able to let it go. You have to be able to understand that resentment is living in the past and it's sterile. It's uncreative. And that's the mark of modern culture all across the world is sterility and lack of creativity. All these people complaining about the, 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 the Western man, the white man, the colonists, the Irish included, we do this too. It's like it's n there's no talk of the future. Yes, th these colonists, these English people, like, you know, we, we've, I've as much of a right to complain as anybody. They were horrible fucks. They, were, they, they literally did a famine and starved us. They literally genocided the Irish. But the other thing is, is that these guys in America, these Anglos and the wasps in America, these people launched man into space. They, you know, they manifested us and took us to incredible destinies. They had creative futures available to them. Sacrificing their potential for the sake of our resentment is not getting us anywhere. It's just about pulling them down. It's just about destroying the English. Like, well, like, what's the great goal of Irish culture? It's like, oh, I'd like to see the English fuck up. I'd like to see the monarchy fall apart. That's it. That's all they care about. There's no creative goals at all. It's just spite. It's just blunt, dark, ugly resentment. It's the demon manifesting again. And if the Irish had the power, they would love to indulge in that. They'd love to do terrible things. They'd love to go and destroy Buckingham Palace, rip apart all those museums. This is just, it's just ugly. And the whole arc of the 20th century has been the, 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 the manifestation of this demonic energy at scale. The rise of the resentment. The English, the Americans, the French, the Germans, the master races, the Nordics, these, these characters who were like the aristocrats of Europe, the North Italians, the Spanish and the Portuguese get it as well, the Western Europeans and the Eastern Europeans as well, these, these, this block of people who created modernity, who created the modern world, who created science, who created everything that we understand as progress, who created all these systems of rights and all these systems of ideas, the language that we have, most of the literature and high art that we have, all of this incredible stuff that they built, all the potential, the great destiny that they're chasing after in America, for example, trying to shoot up into space, all of this stuff has to be destroyed. French identity must come down. The English must be annihilated. The English cannot be proud because their proud annoys me as the Irish man, as the colonized man. I hate them. Fuck them. I want to pull them down. I want them to stop. Well, the thing is, is that what if their pride, despite the fact that they're arrogant, annoying, fucking English, yes, yeah, proper, proper English, yeah, it's not, it annoys me as well. Something deep inside of me, I just go like, like I'm like a bee, just starts buzzing. I'm like fucking English. I have it. I can't overcome it. But at the same time, what if it's tied to something great? What if that pride, that consciousness, that understanding of thyself, that self mastery, what if that is connected to the space race? What if that is connected to the shuttles going up into the air? What if that is connected to Elon Musk's successful, successful attempts, to go to, attempts to go to Mars? What if that's connected to the grandeur of classical music? Could that have come out of anywhere, anywhere apart from the, 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 the culture that these aristocrats had set up in Europe? How could it have come anywhere, you know? We, we hate on these things and destroy them, but we pull down what is the best in us, what is the highest potential of mankind that's been manifested. It's spite towards the beautiful, towards the well turned out, but towards the successful. It's ugly. It's ugliness inside of us because we can't compete. And it makes sense. It's completely logical. They 
in some sense, stole our destiny so they can manifest their own. But if we're going to steal back our destinies, we're going to have to then evolve past the resentment and choose to manifest something. We have to develop that consciousness or else we're not worthy of it. We just tore them down out of blunt spite with no purpose and no goal beyond that. And it was like the Christian movement in Rome. It was like the, the communist movement. It was just pulling something that was beautiful down and scarring its face. It's like a beautiful woman and you run up and throw acid in her face. And it's just, it's just pure sexual envy, jealousy, something dark, chthonic and resentful. It's just spite. Something that was beautiful, that was manifesting itself. It was like a flower in a field and you just stood on it because you were mad that you weren't as beautiful as that. That's what it turns into. And you see this, 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 this justification. This is what we mean by the beautiful ideas, the preachers of equality. Oh, the English, the Americans, the French, they must be destroyed so that we, the minorities, we, the Irish, we, the Jews, we, the colonized, we, the others, we, the, the oppressed, so we can feel that catharsis. And that catharsis is that catharsis of death so we can watch them suffer so we can feel the release of energy out of ourselves and we can feel all that hate and all that those slights and all the thousand sufferings that happened in our lives we can have a direction we can have a black target a scapegoat that we can project that energy out upon we can shuffle it out of ourselves and watch it watch it annihilate something we can express that hate upon something and allow us to release ourselves it's like religious it's some type of psychological ritual that we need to conduct to deal with the fact that we have not become creative and overcome our suffering. And all of this has evolved into the project to annihilate Western culture, to pull it down, to destroy it. This is the core emotion driving it all. This is the chthonic force going inside of it, is narcissism of the oppressed combined with the resentment becoming manifest as a genius. The resentment forming this alternative view of the world that justifies all of its emotional perspectives. This is what's going on. And we Irish are incredibly stupid to go along with this. Incredibly stupid. Because this resentment is endless and it's irrational. And it has no purpose and it has no meaning and it has no intelligence. It's like a tumour. It just, it just does what, it, it just follows on the energy it's getting provided. But it doesn't have a goal. And it doesn't have any nobility. And it's very dangerous. In Russia, it's the same thing. You know, they, the, the Bolsheviks seized equality. And what fucking happened in the end? They all ended up dying. Stalin ended up killing them all. They all seized equality and they started to kill all the kulaks and they got set up the NKVD. And then Stalin comes in and purges them all. Because there's no logic to it. There's no, they're not trying to, they're not fighting on their own team. They're just fighting for that blunt psychosis of power. It's a bloodbath. Robespierre, the same thing, conducted the reign of terror, ended up getting killed himself. It's just nonsense. It's just madness. It's the madness of hate. The, un the low consciousness of hate. This is what's manifest. This is what's becoming genius. And we Irish, we, the Jews as well, these are especially stupid to go along with this because our culture is a part of Western culture. I've been like, I've seen people go around and call Jews wife, for example. You see this with, uh, I think it was Brett Weinstein, Weinstein or whatever his name is, one of those intellectual dork web dudes. And he was called um, a spicy cracker or something like that. He was on some space and he was you know, doing the whole shtick where he's like, I'm, a, I'm oppressed as well. I'm oppressed. And he's trying to simp. You're trying to simp and bond with the resentment. You're trying to say to the black people, it's like, oh, you're, me and you are the same. You know, and it's patronizing. It's like, you know, me and you are the same. It's, you know, it's like, what are you doing, man? It's like, oh, we bond in our resentment and he's, he's trying to say we're one of us and they're just like you're not you're not one of us you look different than us you're not the same as us you know you're, you're not part of our struggle you're not part of our consciousness you're not part of awareness and they push against them then they start calling them white and they're starting to say very clearly to them it's like look man you fucking we got enslaved we're not happy about that we fought to try to create our own identity with hip hop and all this and we don't, just don't like we just don't like this and they push them away and you kind of see that like this trying to trying to trying to entertain and dive into this resentment it goes nowhere it just leads into this schizo madness you can't it's very hard to form a permanent identity out of it and i've been in ireland and i've had people come in these like you know the immigrants are coming in with the new plan to you know make everything transform europe and all this type of stuff and i meet these people who come into ireland and I'm like i'm a very amiable guy i talk to absolutely everybody i speak to everybody and i meet these people they're from like south america there's some people from all over the world and i talk to them and like for example there's this one girl i knew and she was um she was doing some type of she was working on some type of beauty job 
and she was obviously dealing with skin and some some woman came in to do a seminar you know this is the typical kind of corporate you know diversity stuff coming in and the woman comes in to do a seminar and she holds up this thing of all the skin colors and she starts talking about the skin colors and your woman was sort of saying that she was making all these jokes jokes about like you know the white skin is very ugly and it's like very pale and it's the sign of sickliness and the more the further you get towards this color is better you know all these type of things and you know we're trying to move and she was like we're trying to move the world towards this color and your mom was telling me this and she was sort of giggling with it and all this type of stuff and I'm making fun and like I it's not like I don't have a sense of humor I know when someone's making fun and I know when someone's sort of like you know being a bit there, there's something underneath it there's a psychological energy underneath this stuff and I was asking her I was like saying well why why are you why are you saying that why are you thinking this way like why why is that funny there's something in humor sometimes as well Freud would talk about this and it's and she comes out with this confession and she says not confession but she sort of she just, just sort of pops up a like a Freudian slip I guess a, an idea a simple little idea and she says well look you white people you owned the world it was you who were shining in the sun you were the people who succeeded and you oppressed us and took everything from us and you the reason why we did not build great societies is because you took all the resources out of it and you exploit <coughs> you exploited us and now it's our turn to take all the resources off you and us to become on top and us to rise in your place use white people and I kind of had to sit her down I was like look darling like you're going to come over here we're going to welcome you in and I'm happy to be as friendly with you as you want okay because I like you I think you're great I'm an open minded guy all this type of stuff but you've come in we've given you our society the safety of our society the resources the welfare state and you don't even have the appreciation to learn about our history you don't even have the appreciation to sit down and read that we were colonized too you don't understand what we have been through in order to create ourselves as free you just come in and you crudely categorize us as white. You come in and you resent us. You have, you're coming into Europe and seeing Europe as this blob of oppression. You're seeing this blob of evilness. You're not coming in and trying to learn any of the nuances. There's no gratefulness. There's no gratitude and appreciation that you can do this. Instead, there's this energy of resentment. I want to come in and take from these people and exploit their openness and their kindness. And, you know, maybe you could say, oh, fair enough, we, we should exploit the English and the French and the Americans, although that itself is something quite interesting. But even then the Irish, it's not like the Irish ever did anything to you. It's not like they ever went down and colonized South America. They were colonized themselves. But this is the thing. There's no logic to it. And there's no point even explaining it because this is an emotion. It's not going to listen to reason. This stuff is just a psychosis, a downward spiral. And as long as we resent, we will still be part of this. We'll be part of this slave consciousness. And the world will get sucked down into it, like a vortex, like a whirlpool of spite, going nowhere. This blunt, aggressive, downwards falling identity. This, and turning the world into this monolith, this homogenized global culture of hate, of resentment, the victim psychosis that you see going on. And so this is a big question. This is a big, big, big problem. How does one deal with resentment? It is the predicate for the destiny of the future. We, if we want to have a creative destiny, we have to go through an educational process where we learn to identify this emotion for what it is. We learn to understand this emotion for how it works. It's a very nuanced, a complicated emotion, but Nietzsche was correct. He was correct as always a century before any of this stuff even became as relevant as it become now. And we have to understand the meaning of this emotion is that it is not something that we can use to our advantage. It is something that will pull us down along with everybody else. We will end up bickering among ourselves about whether, you know, the, the white Irish or the brown or the Jews, who's the righteous one or who's got the most resentment or well, shouldn't we be on the same team and then we're biting at each other meanwhile we're all standing on top and you know smashing on the heads of the dead English and the French and laughing at the fucked up nature of their culture well at least we fucked up them we're banging baguettes on the French people we're throwing croissants at the French we're like no 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 and then the English are sitting there and we're like I don't know playing football with the crown or something like this but it's like what type of victory is that is you're, you've got a as Johnny Cash said it's like you're standing on an empire of dirt you've created nothing you've fallen into a new dark age that's what has happened your resentment has become genius and it has consumed the world like a cancer tumor and pulled down everything alongside with it that's all that's happened and to make it worse 
you will do this unconsciously. But there's very smart people out there, the preachers of equality, the archons, who know that you're stupid enough for fa to fall for this, who know that you're low conscious consciousness enough to, to not be able to overcome that resentment in yourself and become creative. And they have figured out a way to weaponize that resentment, to grab that resentment and steer it. Like a high magician, they can grab that and direct it in whatever way they want. And they're going to exploit you. I could spend all day talking to you about this. I could spend hours more ranting to you about the nature of resentment and how it manifests within the minds of the many. This ever-present demon. It is so big. Nietzsche is just so accurate in the things that he sees. He constantly just nails it with this type of stuff. He penetrates so deep into psychology and he calls us out. This is why people are like, he's he's up there on Incel Mountain. He's up there in his, his Zarathustra Mountain writing books that hurt my feelings with his mean little mustache. This is why people get so mad at him because he's so perceptive. He just pokes right into your very, very core because it was like me. If I, I keep on saying this, but I, I know this because it's so personal to me. I was in that place and it's so petty and it's so childish to sit there and just resent my parents resent my mum and dad be a little fucking baby you know me sitting there as this baby and me being like oh what was them what was me and i'm coming up with all these beautiful ideas and this beautiful story and i put myself in this centralized you know narrative that i tell myself this victim psychosis that i'm telling myself of the struggle of my life and i am um, project i project the pain i have upon them this cruel ugly pain upon them and i create this sort of story in my head about what i need them to to become i need them to be crippled I need them to become humble. I need them to be broken. I'm sort of repeating myself, but this is so perceptive because it's so ugly for me to hear this. If you had told me that, I would have gotten mad. I would have said, fuck you. Don't tell me that shit. That's not it. I'm in pain. I'm suffering. I'm weak. You must validate my weakness. You must validate the fact. If my mom and my dad tried to sit down and explain that to me, I would have been like, no, you must tell me. You must tell me that I am right and that my pain is justified and you must be sorry. And then I'd start getting angry. The, the resentment would start to fester, would start to turn into something uglier and more dense. And you see this exact same thing play out on a, a geopolitical, super political phase, a cultural um, stage. It's also big as well it's so small but also so big you see these people like the irish the, per the perfect example just possessed by this resentment and it's ugly and it's uncreative and it's sterile and they have the masters in the english the conquerors like the romans like the christians to the romans this stuff just it's like a super pattern that is always there and you have these romans these great creators and the irish and they or whatever the n the the archetype being the slave the conquered the oppressed the defeated the unhappy feeling their their victimness which is completely true it's not like it's not true it's not like it's not real this this story is real but their victimness is becoming is festering and becoming horrible and they want to project into the roman into the master into the conqueror into the englishman they want to project guilt into them they want to install within them hesitation they want to make them doubt you see this stuff play out between man and wife you know, though maybe the wife resents the husband, so she wants to cuckold him spiritually and make him doubt himself, crush his masculinity. She shit tests him, as the red pill guys say, and then eventually he buckles and then she divorces him because he's no longer a man. And he's like, what the fuck just happened there? And Nietzsche's sitting there with his mustache and be like, well, you wonder why I remained an incel. You wonder why I ran up to the mic now. Now you understand. <laughs> now you understand how it works. And the same with the nerd and the jock, you know, the casual high school, God damn it, the high school drama, man. The casual high school drama where you go in and you have the jock he is unconscious he, he is he's without conscience in some sense he just acts he is more natural he's pagan he walks around the high school and he's a badass and he gets all the girls and he's a good athlete and he's cool and he moves fast and he's he's, he's you know he jokes at people he's you know, a bit of a bully pushes people around and stuff like this he's handsome he's doing well with himself maybe he's not even like a dick maybe he's not necessarily even like a bad bully but he's just a winner he's just a born winner you know very natural very very in his body very lifelike and you, then you have the resentful nerd, the guy in the corner, you know, the guy who, who loses to the jock, who can't get the girl, who sits there and he's, he's all, he's all like stuck up and he's all hammer, nattering away in his, his, his fingernails and writing uh, his little cope thesis. He's reading all his book cope. He's like, well, I'm sophisticated. I'm intellectual. And he's telling himself that victim story, you know, this crude, 
ugly, brutish man. This 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 chud, you know, this uh this this thad, the 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 dumbass, you know, the the caveman. He's um he's cruel, he's crooked, he's mean, he's all these bad things, and he doesn't understand and um, the the beauty inside my soul. He doesn't understand how I'm more intelligent. He doesn't understand how I'm um, more sophisticated. This beautiful story. Never never does the the nerd actually display any of the self consciousness that he wants other people to have. Never does he sit down and say, well maybe I don't work out enough. Maybe I'm not healthy enough. Maybe I'm not charismatic enough. Maybe maybe I'm not trying to improve myself enough. Maybe I'm do- performing escapism and I'm a ro- romanticizing my escapism in order to justify the fact that I am a coward and a loser. Maybe that guy is actually just not a coward. Maybe at some point he suffered from many of the problems that I'm suffering from, but he overcame them through good, good strength of will and good strength of character. And that never crosses his mind, of course. He tries to push that out of himself because the resentful person, despite the fact that they t- like claim to things like conscience and self-consciousness, are always delusional. They're always telling themselves a delusion because that's what I did to myself. I lied to myself. I told myself beautiful lies. And you must understand this. You must understand this psychology. This is how profound this is. And so the nerd sits there and he tells himself this story about his majesty, his profoundness, his depth. He's a, he's a book man, you know, a man of the books. He's intellectual, he's smart, he's sophisticated, cultured, civilized. I'm a civilized nerd, you know, I've, I've got a alternate tastes and all this. And he starts to do these things, these pernicious, like grima, worm tongue type things, where he goes up and he starts to maybe say to the girls in the class that like, you know, that big jock is a, is a misogynist. He doesn't understand how women works or stuff like this. He'd start to go in with these wormy attitudes to try subvert the image of the jock. He tries to pull the jock's status down. He tries to demoralize the jock. He might even start to, you know, whisper or say stuff to the jock like, oh, you're you're immoral. You're crude. You're not conscious. You're not con you have no conscience about what you're doing to us. You don't reflect on what you are. You're just this natural beast. You know, you're a part of nature. You're naturally expressive. And this is, you know, you're a pagan. You're naturally full of life. But we need to break that within you. We need to cuckle that spirit within you. And we need to destroy that. We need to get you to go against life. We need to get you, when you feel those passions that cause you to be athletic and be creative and be bombastic and be extroverted, we need to install within you a mind virus, a mind virus of hesitation. We need to install within you guilt. We need to put inside your head something that makes you doubt yourself. Because this then becomes this psychic power that we have over you, that when that instinct, that passion bursts up and says to you to become creative, that life force screams, this thing like a makina, like an alien grabs on top of it and says, no, push it back down. Doubt yourself. Doubt thyself shall be the ultimate thing. And you will listen to me. I will install like a super ego. I will install in conscience inside of you and you will listen to me, jock. And then the nerd enacts his revenge upon the jock and he controls him and he butchers him. He becomes the master over the jock. And of course, what does the nerd do? then. The nerd constantly de-pedestalizes the jock's status until he can turn the jock into a castrati, a guy in a straitjacket who's completely controlled. He tries to push him out of it. If you actually want to watch this stuff, this is such a strange quote to put in. I think there's a film called 21 Jump Street um, with Channam Tatum and uh, I can't remember the other guy. He's a little small fat guy and it's just so perfect. It just so perfectly describes the manifestation of this, this energy and you get to understand it. It's so, so brilliant. Highly recommend you watch that. Maybe we'll do a Boyo movie hour where we'll sit down and we'll watch that stuff. And this is such simple, petty human psychology, but it plays out everywhere. It plays out in the drama of my little life. It definitely plays out in the drama of your life. It definitely shows up in your 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 reality. You have it inside of you. We all struggle with resentment. It is a part of life. There's actually nothing wrong with the emotion itself. It's very, very normal. All our emotions are justified and normal. And we must learn to manage them and understand them in order to evolve and transform into the best versions of ourselves, the most creative versions of self we possibly can. But what ultimately happens is seeing this at scales, you start to see how dangerous it is. You see this playing out in culture, as I said, and you've got that precise thing. You've got the victims. They're like those nerds that they are trying to flatter their own egos. They're narcissistically trying to say why why they are better than the masters, than the French, the English, the Irish are doing this to them, as I said. And they're trying to install within them this guilt. And this guilt is self-destructive. And Nietzsche would say, again, with such a penetrating instinct and insight into the masters, into the, the, the successful, the creative, that they tend to be naive. Because you've become successful, you're like the jock, you've, you, you're winning. You don't spend too much time thinking about what's going on. And so the resentful tend to be more crafty, more intelligent, more sly. The 
Irish tend to be more self-aware, you know, and tend to be even more more aware of what the English are than the English themselves. But the problem is, is that they're only aware like that because they had to sit there like a cuckold and watch from a distance and think about this person and ponder and, and craftily try to, you know, f- drum their fingers together and come up with plans and ways to subvert them, which the English and the, the creators, the masters are out there just building things, you know, building great civilization, just letting their natural intelligence be bound to their creativity, which externalizes them like a Promethean force that gets them to shoot towards the future, says, you know, instead of them saying, right, how am I going to ponder about all these little ethnicities and all these rivals that I have and all this? Why don't I just focus on getting to space or something like this or making high art or building a cathedral? And this is the type of thing that you see, this natural creativity. This is why this is so dangerous. It's because that instinct within the masters, that naive innocence within the masters is tied to their empowerment of all of the redemption of all of mankind whereas they they can all be they, they could bring us to you know heights that we've never seen of before this is what science did for the world the, the western man and we hate the western man and the western man oppressed and all this western man's science has saved so many lives he has made so many possibilities available and it's incredible what those achievements were and it came from those naive masters not knowing what they're doing they're just going and being creative just going and following their gut in some sense but they are fundamentally unaware. They are blessed by being the forgetful. They forget about the, the slights because they succeed. And because of that forgetfulness, they throw this stuff off. And they lose that craftiness. They lose that cruelty. They lose that, 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 that depth of hate that you can have if you are weak, if you are resentful, if you are a failure. Instead, if you are in that position, you become more, you think more, you hold on to the grudge, you know? You become more begrudging. You become more spiteful and hateful. Your hate Festers. You think about it longer. You become cruel. You become pondering. And this is why then you plan to overthrow them, tear down all their creative pen- potential, because you don't care about that. You care about destroying them, absolutely. You de- care about pulling them down and putting yourself in their place. And that becomes your reactionary justification for your position. You say, I will pull down the masters. And this will be my way of saving the world. I will make the masters conscious. And this is what will redeem the world. And you see this redemption talk in all sorts of ways that it manifests. In the nerd saying that I'm going to change the way the jock works. I'm going to reform the jock. I'm going to install with him, him within him guilt and consciousness and hesitation and doubt. And then he will be different. And I will have changed him. And it's a moral project. I will have saved him. I will have made him wiser. Made him like me. All the way up to looking at what Christianity did with Rome. We will redeem deem the Romans, the blunt, ugly, pagan Romans, even though they had created up to that point the most advanced engineering seen before the Western world, the one of the most advanced civilizations that had ever graced the planet. But instead, these people needed to be fixed. They needed to be redeemed because the resentful wanted to pull them down and redeem the Romans, fix the Romans, modulate the Romans, install guilt within the Romans. And they achieved that. And of course, what happened is all that great creativity, that Promethean creativity that was in Rome, it just went bundling and shutting shuttling downwards and disappeared. Then people could not remember how to build the aqueducts. They didn't even know what they were properly anymore. It was just a myth of a, a, bar, a far gone age of long past. And you see this with the Irish. You see this in this ethnic narcissism within the Irish. We sit down. You see this with all the ethnicities nowadays. They just sit down and they just bitch and they resent and they go into their victim psychosis and they just want to see the English fail. They just want to see the masters fail. They want to see the conquering, the successful fail. And they don't care if they pull down science or potential or the future or creativity. Don't care about any of that stuff because it's not about reality. It's not about the high greatness of mankind. It's not about any of those things. It's not about some noble redemption of success, of blasting forward and marrying with nature and learning natural philosophy, which is science, and knowing how to gain for us the most creative power, express the will to power, as Nietzsche says, to its highest level. Instead, it's just about this psychotic resentment, this psychotic need to redeem the world by making it more suitable to my pain. That's what it's all about. What a big story. What a fascinating insight into the nature of man. What a ugly thing to pull up. It's like lifting up a rock and seeing all those weird insects being like, blah, 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 blah. do they really sound like that stuff? I don't know. Do they sound like that stuff? <laughs> I think those instincts, are, those in- insects would probably come after me if they heard me saying that. But alas, I'm going to leave it there because there's too much to say. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what you can do in order to put yourself in a more creative position in this life. So as I said, a big, big part of overcoming resentment for me was 
growing up, maturing, and realizing that I needed to, to take responsibility for my own, my own life. Now, this is the big conspiratorial view of the world, because I noticed that even the institutions that I was existing within had this attitude of installing this resentment within me. I was learning, you know, I was going in and I was having information shoved into my head and all this, like, rational nerd critiques of Western culture and all this type of stuff. And I learned that my core problem was tied to what my resentment was telling me. I was saying to myself, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. This is my, I suffer because I am weak. I suffer because I am incompetent. I suffer because I have not achieved what I need to achieve. And so a big, big, big thing for me was turning around and saying to myself, how do I transform? What does that actually entail? What does it mean for me to individuate, to go in my own path and become better and become juicier and become stronger, to self-improve? What does that actually mean? And a significant realization for me was moving away from theory selling into practice, moving away from sitting around and, you know, pondering and blathering and instead saying to myself, what does it actually mean? What is the actual procedures I need to do in order to change. It's just like with the gym, you know, you're going into the gym and you're saying to yourself, the gym was a big part of it for me, but going into the gym and saying to yourself, I want to, I want to look more ideal. I resent handsome people like Steph because I am not ripped. I'm not jacked. I don't look like them. And so I come up with all this cope where I say, oh, you know, don't be talking about my weight or it's okay to be skinny or bodybuilders are like all are dumb idiots anyway. You know, it's the nerd, the jock thing showing up again. There's this blunt petty resentment towards success. It's just like, you're beautiful, you've achieved something, blah, blah, blah. Now, the thing is, is that the reason why, and this is such a big Nietzschean insight, so big, it's such a flooring conception. When you look at something you envy, you should always inspect this. It's trying to tell you, envy is a good mo emotion that is trying to tell you that the thing that you envy is hiding behind the thing you admire. You sit there and you look at that bodybuilder who's in shape and you envy that person because you admire them. Because there's a part of you deep down, chthonic, primal, long before modern consciousness, long before any of this cope, long before your petty individual life. It's deeper in your DNA than your ego and all these more recent phenomena that have appeared on Earth. Instead, it's this deep primal feeling of health, this primal vision of success, the uber mensch within, you could say the primal mensch, the super man with well, the super ape, I guess is what you might call him what was when ape was evolving into man. And he, you, you see in that the, the platonic ideal of what you could look like, you know, a strong physique, big muscular chest, strong shoulders, athletic, handsome, clear skin, healthy, full of energy, full of life, eyes bright, charming, witty, all these type of things. You see this and you see these characters going around succeeding and winning they're they're getting the girls they're doing all this type of stuff they're they're doing the winning procedures of life this is going to make you envious because fuck me it's hard to see that stuff when you're not there and this is the important thing to understand that's normal that's okay in fact if you can feel that emotion and digest it properly it can be one of the most stimulating and powerful emotions you can have because all emotions come from the life force from the will to power all emotions come from that part of your soul that are trying to push you towards life and so when you feel that when you feel that envy and you don't let it go inside of you and create within you the festering resentment that causes you to become a cope er instead you transform that and you listen to it and you realize i want to be like that person and you get this sort of like cynical admiration you kind of grit your teeth and you're like fuck that guy i'm mad that that guy's winning but i'm gonna win as well this turns into a powerful stimulant and this is what i saw in myself i'd look at my heroes and i'd be sort of angry i'd sort of be envious i'd look at people around me that were doing well and I'd be envious and angry but I'm, I, I was able to digest that stuff eventually and understand that there's admiration behind that there's the vision of heroism behind that that i want to pursue and I started to pursue this stuff. I started to say to myself, how do I become like that? I can't go to the gym and theory sell about it. I can't go, I can't stay at home and write about it on the internet. I can't stay at home and write about how much I admire the physique and all this type of stuff. I can't go onto the internet and go to these forums and blather on about this stuff. I have to go and do the procedures. I have to do the work is the simplest way to put it. I have to go and understand the process of learning, the difficulty of learning. And this is why you realize most people don't do this stuff is because the actual process of being creative, of transforming yourself, of building yourself into something better to build a civilization all the way up to that scale of like building a, a giant civilization running science running giant creativity projects all the way down to transforming your body transforming your skill sets that is fucking hard and it's not as romantic as you want it to be it's about doing 
clear and precise procedures. It's about sitting down and doing exactly what works. All the little, little nitty gritty little bits of things that are going to make a difference. Nobody's going to hold your hand through it. Instead, you just have to take the responsibility and do, do it yourself. This is what I have to do. You have to get up and you have to say to yourself, well, what are the exercises? What are the procedures? What are the steps that I have to follow in order to make myself better? What do I have to go through? You can do all you want and say to yourself, right, I need to go through therapy. I need to go through cope. I need to go through all this type of stuff. I need to write more. I need to read more books. But none of that stuff it has a direct effect because it's not procedurally intelligent. You're not focusing on the thing that actually matters. You're not stimulating your body to transform. The things that matter is developing skills, developing procedures, developing exercises, developing work, developing things that are going to allow you to transform your situation. So for example, part of mine was going to the gym, learning how to fight, learning how to lift, learning all the little nitty gritty, gritty bits of doing various exercises and procedures correctly. And this stuff is not romantic, but the thing is, is that this is actually what makes you transform. And then what happens is you stop being resentful because suddenly you feel like you're you have power over your situation i could sit down and understand that if i go and i do these procedures right something's going to happen to me i'm going to grow i'm going to transform and this proves to be absolutely true and eventually my resentment began to evaporate away and i became happier i became more joyful i became a master i became someone on the path to the ubermensch i became someone who transformed and it's easy once you realize it that way it just takes patience and that's actually one of the big realizations it takes higher virtues in order to control resentment and you must develop them. This is a part of growing up. Now, my big thing speaking with people is that obviously when I dropped out of college, I went on that pursuit of learning sets of skills that I needed because I was in college. I was having all this theory cell crap shoved into my head, having the Marxism, having all this stuff getting pushed in front of me. Information. They were trying to turn me into the nerd. And I was like, with my, my jujitsu, I was like, it's not happening. It's not happening. I had these this deep spiritual immune system. I was like, I'm not, I'm not becoming a nerd, motherfuckers. I'm not, it's not happening. So I broke out and I, I remember so distinctly, God God bless me for being able to think this way. I remember so distinctly, I had this realization where I was like, I don't want to be a theory guy. I don't want to be a theory cell. I want to be practice, not theory, practice, not theory, practice. And so I dropped down and I used the money that I had, as I said, to find people who could teach me skills, how to speak better, how to write, how to articulate myself, how to present myself, how to hold conversation, how to be charismatic, what, what it meant to go up and be brave and going to push myself into new social situations. What skills required me to go out into the world and go on an adventure and launch myself upon the world? What dirty, little, ugly, difficult procedures I needed to go through in order to do that? And that was what was transformative. That was a big deal for me, is like learning these skills, specifically developing the capacity to externalize my logos and be someone who produces theory and produces cope instead of someone who consumes cope and consumes theory. That was a big deal for me. That was something that absolutely changed me. And a huge part of this, of course, is me sitting down and saying, right, I'm going to get up on YouTube. I'm going to go and put myself up there out in the world. I'm going to take advantage of the situation I have right now here in front of me. Because for a long time, I was resentful even of the modern world. I was sitting around, and I was saying, oh, I hate the fact that everybody's on YouTube. Why, are, why isn't everybody, you know, making CDs like they used to? I could just be a musician who makes CDs. Why aren't everybody like the way things were before? You see all this same psychology showing up now in a different manifestation. And instead, I overcame all that stuff. And it was like, amor fati. I embrace this life as it is right in front of me. And I'm going to engage in it. I'm going to do the best I possibly can. I'm going to learn how to make the most of what's going on. That involved going up there and starting to talk on fucking YouTube of all places. And now on TikTok, this has been the next one that I've been up to. I'm like, oh, what really? State propaganda? What, what am I doing? But no, instead I was like, right, you have to hop on board with this stuff. It's about learning the procedures that you need to get there. So what I have done is achieved an awful lot in this perspective. And I work with people. If you're interested, you can come in and I can actually sit you down and walk you through procedures that will lead to you actually getting better at the fundamental skills that you need, such as being able to speak, such as being able to write, such as being able to articulate yourself, to storytell, to present yourself to people, to build your presence. Then I'll show you pragmatic procedures that you can begin to use, the tools that are available out, out there in the modern world for you to begin building an online presence, begin building a better reputation, begin taking these skills and actually using them in an intelligent way in order to generate more wealth for yourself, more success for yourself, better relationships, all these type of things, all these things that lead to the success in life. I have done this for myself. I can do this with you if you're interested. And then taking you and training you, basically showing you what you need in order to transform, to become better at what you need to do. Now, all of this stuff's quite vague. I'm talking a little bit abstract. So what it, you can do is you can go down and apply below. It's all completely free. 
free and then you get a call I'll send you all the free videos that explain to you how all this stuff works if you want and then that's basically how it all works so if you're interested go down below apply set it all up I'll send you all more information on the specifics of how this works ways that you can apply storytelling and speaking to your life ways that you can apply this stuff maybe in a financial sense or a business sense or maybe in a more social relationship sense or something like this or maybe if you just want to start some type of online platform a YouTube channel or whatever it is if you're interested in any of that stuff it is all down below you can pop in for free put in your application we'll chat to you on the other side thank you very much for listening do not be resentful allow resentment to be crushed within yourself and transformed into a stimulating emotion which allows you to affirm your life and become juicy and as i said apply below for a call and we'll chat to you there thank you very much stay well lads bye bye stay juicy bye bye i'm gonna say goodbye now bye